So last week we took a break from our fall series, Reopening the Bible, for our unified worship service. Uh, and we all gathered together here in this place. Uh, two campuses, five worshiping communities, uh, six if you count those worshiping with us online, and I do. Uh, you guys are part of us, uh, all together here uh, to praise and thank and worship our God and to celebrate the unity that we share together in Jesus. And I've got to say, I had no idea how much I needed that. Uh, it was good for my soul uh, to see this place full, to see that wall opened up, to get to meet and greet so many of you in the commons after worship, and to remember that the kingdom of God is a whole lot bigger than what we just see here in any one service on Sunday morning, uh, that we're just a sliver, just a part of what our God is doing in this world. And I heard similar things from many of you this past week, and so a huge thank you uh, to all of the volunteers, the musicians, the singers, all of the leaders that helped make last week possible. And this week, uh, we jump back in uh, to our Reopening the Bible series. Uh, we started back in September with accounts of creation, of God's covenant, his promise to Abraham in the Exodus, and we saw that our God is the creator of all things, uh, that our God is the God who makes and keeps promises to bless his people. He's the one who delivers us from sin and from bondage, and that we, as his people, are creatures uh, called to take care of his creation, uh, that we are chosen in Jesus to be both blessed and a blessing, and that we are set free uh, to worship and serve God with a full heart, to trust in him above everything else, Creation, covenant, exodus. Uh, major themes in the scriptures and in the Old Testament. Uh, and this week, we kind of flip the page into the New Testament, and we focus on the word Messiah. Uh, and as we hear the perhaps familiar account of Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave three days later, uh, we see that our God is the God who saves. Uh, that you and I, that we are sinners, we're the ones in need of salvation, and that we respond by believing, by trusting in him. Uh, and as we'll see, belief is not simply intellectual assent on one hand, uh, it's not unrelenting passion on the other hand, but to believe is to act, uh, to take steps, to risk as though this were true. It's to trust and place every area of our lives under the lordship of the one who saved us and gave his life for us. But what does all that mean? What does it mean to save. Uh, salvation is, is kind of a, a churchy word. It's a religious word that's accumulated all sorts of baggage over the years. Uh, when you think of the word salvation or, or getting saved, uh, maybe you think of harps, you think of clouds, you think of uh, little fat baby angels uh, sitting and singing the cherubs. Uh, maybe you think of a tent revival, of a street corner preacher yelling at everyone passing by, warning them, get saved or else. And we all kind of know what that means, right? It's code for get your act together, clean up your life, make better choices. But interestingly enough, the Bible doesn't talk about salvation in those terms. In fact, in Scripture, salvation means to rescue out of a desperate situation. Uh, and perhaps ironically, the way that our culture thinks and talks about salvation, at least outside of a church context, is oftentimes closer to what the Bible means when it talks about being saved. In many ways, our culture is obsessed with stories of salvation, with the idea of being saved, the need for a hero and a savior. Uh, it's in our entertainment, our movies, as heroes and even superheroes have dominated the box office and streaming services. Uh, these larger-than-life figures that go to extraordinary lengths to save humanity from one calamity after another. It's in our politics. As every election cycle, uh, different men and women and political parties promise uh, a type of salvation to save democracy, to, to preserve or save the American way of life. Uh, it's in our medicine and our science as first the vaccine and now different therapeutic drugs and other measures promise to save us from the pandemic. And it's in everyday stories, the ones that we hear about good Samaritans and first responders uh, and ER heroes. We love salvation stories. It's almost as if we intuitively know that there is something wrong with the world the way it is right now and that we're in need of someone to come and do something about it. We're in need of a savior to rescue us in one way or another. And I would argue that the reason 
we love salvation stories, that we gravitate towards these, is that they're a sort of echo. They point us to the salvation story, to the story of a God who saves us in the most unexpected ways from the most desperate situation any of us could imagine. A story that has as its climax the hero, Jesus of Nazareth, dying on a cross and rising from the dead three days later to save us from the calamity of sin and eternal death. And so we ask, who is God? Our God is the God who saves. And it is this ultimate salvation in Jesus uh, that the entire Old Testament, that all of the stories and accounts that we have looked at so far has been building towards. Uh, In the beginning, God made his creation good. But then, then just three chapters into the story, Adam and Eve sin, and all of a sudden, things aren't so good anymore. There's sickness and pain. There's calamity and death. Uh, All of that was introduced into God's perfect creation. And we see that sin isn't just a mistake. It's not just a poor choice. It's not just a minor character flaw. But sin is an intentional rebellion, an act of treason against the creator. It's this impossible dream of having a good and happy life apart from God, the creator of all life. And so God does what many of us have done when our masterpiece has been ruined, he curses. He curses Adam, he curses Eve, he curses the ground, he curses creation, he curses the serpent. God curses, but he also makes a promise. And he promises that one day a savior will come, a Messiah appointed by God, the one who will set everything right again. It's a promise God repeats to Abraham and says, through you, you're the one who uh, who will be the patriarch, your descendants will be this Messiah, and everyone will be blessed through him. It's a promise that's foreshadowed by the Exodus, the story of deliverance as God rescues his people from a desperate situation of slavery and bondage in Egypt. And we could go on down through the line from Joshua and the judges, David and the kings, uh, the exile in return, every twist, every turn of the story, every new character that, that steps onto the stage inviting the question, Is this the one? Is the Messiah finally here? Is this the one who will finally rescue us and deliver us, not just from the desperate situation we face right now, but from the cycle and the curse of sin forever? It's the question that the Gospels present about Jesus. In Jesus' day, the disciples and the crowds and even the Pharisees and the scribes were, were asking and wrestling with this question, is Jesus the one? Is he the Messiah? Is he the one that was promised from long ago? And throughout the beginning of the Gospels, everything looks very promising. Uh, everything from the circumstances around Jesus' birth uh, to the fulfillment of ancient prophecies, everything from his teaching and the miracles, everything's pointing towards, yes, finally, the long-promised Messiah has come. Then we get to our reading today in Luke chapter 23, and it, and it seems like something's gone terribly wrong because, because in Luke 23, we see this Messiah, we see Jesus dying on a cross, betrayed by his people, condemned to death by the Roman government, and Luke tells us that as they watched him die, the rulers scoffed at him, they mocked Jesus, and specifically they mocked him for thinking that he was that one that he was the Messiah. I invite you to read these words with me, Luke 23. And the people stood by, watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. He is the Christ of God, the chosen one. You see, there were certain expectations of Messiah, who he would be, where he would come from, what he would do, and perhaps the most important expectation of the Messiah was that he wouldn't die. Uh, And and that makes sense, right? After all, it's kind of hard to be a hero, kind of hard to be the savior if you're dead. And so as he hung on the cross, the the rulers mocked Jesus and they said, if you are the Christ, save yourself. And the soldiers who were executing him mocked him and said, save yourself. And one of the criminals who was hanging next to him, condemned to die with Jesus, said, save yourself. If you're really that one, if you're really the Christ, save yourself. Save yourself. And then maybe we'll believe that you can save us too. Save 
yourself. If we understand sin as all of our attempts to achieve a good and happy life apart from God, if we understand sin as the temptation to save yourself, then it's the temptation. It's the temptation of all humanity. It's the temptation of Adam and Eve in the garden to try to be like God apart from God, to do it for themselves. Uh, it was a temptation of Abraham uh, to produce an heir all by himself, apart from God's promise. It was a temptation of the people of Israel there when they were trapped between the sea and between Pharaoh's army to save themselves by surrender, by submitting again to slavery, rather than risk that God wouldn't show up. It's our temptation today, particularly for us who live in the most wealthy, the most technologically advanced, the most self-sufficient society the world has ever seen. For us who pride ourselves on independence, on not accepting help, on, on in fact being the ones to give help. No one rescues us, we rescue others because we're self-sufficient. We can take care of ourselves. And after all, who needs God when most of our desperate situations can be solved by swiping a credit card or taking a pill or, or doing a search on Google for the answer? Who needs a savior when we can simply work harder, smarter, outspend, outinvent, solve our problems on our own? And yet, this attitude of self-sufficiency, this knee-jerk reaction we all have to try to save ourselves actually just magnifies our need for a true savior because it puts a spotlight on our sin, on all of the ways we try uh, to achieve and grasp and secure life for ourselves apart from God. Uh, author and columnist David Brooks uh, in his book Road to Character put it this way. He says, so long as you believe you are the captain of your own life, you will drift farther and farther away from the truth. So long as you believe that you are the captain of your own life, you will drift farther and farther away from the truth. In other words, as long as you insist on saving yourself, as long as you insist on doing it on your own, as long as you reject help from others and even from God, you also reject the Savior, the Messiah, the one God appointed to save you. You choose yourself over Jesus. So if we ask our second question, who are we? And if we consider that, that sin is all of our attempts to save ourselves apart from God, the answer becomes crystal clear. We're sinners. Every one of us. And yet the good news is that our God saves and specifically, our God saves sinners. I invite you to read these words with me, words of Jesus from Mark chapter 2. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick and came not to call the righteous but sinners. There's a paradox in the Christian faith that God saves sinners. And it sounds backwards when you first think about it, uh, we would expect a holy and righteous God to prefer and favor holy and righteous people. Uh, the people who have their stuff together, not the ones who are desperate and needy. Uh, the people who are healthy, not the sick. The ones who are whole, not the broken. Uh, the ones who follow the rules and do it the right way. Not sinners like you and me. But we need to look to the cross once again and remember who it is that receives salvation there. It's a criminal. One condemned to die along with Jesus for what he had done. One who recognizes his desperation and need, who acknowledges that he is in a hopeless, desperate situation, who confesses his sin and guilt and simply says, Jesus, Remember me. That's the one who receives the promise of paradise and of salvation. You see, the truth is, every one of us is desperate and needy. 
And, and we all have ways we try to cover it over, whether it's with wealth, with productivity, with being popular, with our smarts, with what we've done, with what we know. But all of those just become ways of grasping at life, trying to save ourselves apart from God. Truth is, we're all sinners. We're all desperate and needy. And so rather than stubbornly insisting that you can save yourself, acknowledge your sin. Confess your need. Look to Jesus, the one who didn't save himself, but instead gave himself up that you might be saved and receive the salvation of your God. So then we ask, how do we respond? What do we do with all of this? Towards the end of his gospel, John writes uh, the reason why he wrote, uh, the purpose of his gospel, of this good news of salvation. I invite you to read these words with me. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. How do we respond faithfully? John says, believe. And we've talked a lot about belief and trust throughout this series over these last few weeks. And I'm under no illusion that simply if I stand up here or Pastor Jeff or someone else stands up here and tells you to believe, uh, that all of a sudden that's going to you know, kind of flip a switch for you and, and you'll get it. In fact, that might actually make it worse. Uh, because to believe on one hand is not uh, simply intellectual knowledge. It's not as if you can think about it hard enough and then all of a sudden understand it. You, there's nothing to get cognitively. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, it's not simply an emotion, a feeling, uh, wishful thinking. You can't believe something into existence. And so in some ways, to be told to believe might only make it worse. Might only make belief one more way we try to cling and save ourselves as if we could gin it up, produce it in ourselves. You can't make someone believe. But you can act upon belief. And C.S. Lewis once wrote that only a real risk tests the reality of a belief. Uh, and let me give you a kind of a, a simple, uh, everyday sort of example of what it looks like to act on your belief. My guess is uh, that most of you uh, went through a green light on your way here. Uh, not those of you worshiping online, you're, you're still at home, but at some point we've all had that, uh, that experience of, of going through a green light. And my guess is that you didn't give it another thought, except maybe to say, thank God I made the light, I'm not going to be late again. Fair enough. But what you didn't think about is that car coming from the right at 40 miles an hour. You didn't consider if that person was going to stop or not, if there was going to be a crash, if maybe going through that intersection was the very last thing you ever did. You didn't think about any of that because you believed that they would stop. And so you went through the light without a second thought. Only a real risk tests the reality of a belief. Of course, a green light is a relatively trivial example of this sort of belief, one that we've gotten so used to it, it works on our subconscious, uh, we don't even register the risk. We simply go straight through the light at 30 or 40 or, or 50 miles an hour or more. But how much more? How much more is the one who laid down his life that you might get yours back? How much more is that one, Jesus, the Christ, worthy of your trust, your belief, your reliance and action? And so this week I challenge you, consider what is an area of your life where you're particularly tempted to save yourself, to reach, to grasp, uh, to try to gather or to gain a happy and good life apart from God. Uh, where on Sunday, it, that's one thing, but, but the rest of the week, well, that's real life. I've got to make it on my own. Where is, that, where is that place for you? And then dare to be a criminal. 
dare to be a sinner and acknowledge your need. Confess that sin and place every area of your life into the nail-pierced hands of your Savior. We learned a few weeks ago that Jesus' name means Yahweh saves or or God saves uh, and that it's more than a name. It's who he is. It's what he does every time and without fail. Your God saves. And in Jesus, your God has saved you. In his name, amen.